an MR. You of course go in for informed consent. You do tell them that this is what you think you should be doing, but you do tell them that there is no great consensus on this in the world. And uh, you only do it uh, in a routine list with all equipment available and adequate surgical expertise available. We are not doing this at night as an urgent operation, as used to be done when we initially started out in our enthusiasm. So that is how we do it. As I said, we used to do this with an external ethmoidectomy, and the first half of a series till 98, 99 was external ethmoidectomy, and now we do it endoscopically. Um, so again, to recapitulate on how you do it, I spoke a little bit on it yesterday, but how you do it, we do it exclusively transphenoidal. That is a direct way to get to the optic canal. Uh, it's simple. It's the optic canal is right next to the air space in the sphenoid. And uh, of course, the idea of the operation is to focus only on the optic canal because this is the only part of the, uh, of the optic nerve which can get constricted in a bony canal. Uh, so optic canal decompression, you do a CT to look at sphenoid nematization, you do a CT to look at the position of the optic nerve in the, in the sphenoid. It can be a little bit variable depending on how the sphenoid is nematized. If the lesser wing is nematized, then it often means that the optic nerve would be around the mid-level on the vertical, on the lateral wall of the, uh, of the, uh, of the sphenoid, with nematization going above it onto the lesser wing. And if the sphenoid is less nematized, then you often find that the optic nerve is really at the top border of the... Uh, so today, yes, CT, you should do CTs to find out uh, where exactly uh, the nerve is in the sphenoid. And uh, uh, that is the operation in a very short video clip. What you see out there is uh, the sphenoid sinus, which has been opened out. Uh, we have done an endoscopic ethmoidectomy followed by sphenoidotomy. If you look at here, and I'm sure everybody today, all neurosurgeons, everybody knows that how to get to the sphenoid. So you do the ethmoidectomy here, you do the sphenoidotomy, you get into the sphenoid sinus. And what you see here is on the right side, you can see the orbital periosteum there. The wall between the sphenoid, with the, between the ethmoid and the orbit has been removed, the lamina papyracea, so that you follow, you find the orbital periosteum and you just follow the orbital periosteum back. And when you follow the orbital periosteum back, it obviously takes you to the optic nerve. Oftentimes the optic nerve is, or the optic canal is nice and prominent on the lateral wall and sometimes it is not. But either way, if you follow the orbital periosteum back, that is the simplest uh, landmark to take you to the optic nerve. And that is the principal landmark we tend to take. Most times the, uh, the optic canal wall is not very thick and you can actually just chisel it off, so to say, with a, or curate it out with a periosteal elevator. But once in a while you need to drill especially anteriorly, because the anterior wall of the optic ring is where the thickest part of the optic canal is. You continue going back till the curve, nerve curves medially, and that is a key point in our um, uh, technique, because when the cur nerve curves medially, if you look at the scan, what that means is that you've gone beyond the canal and you're now in the intracranial bits. So you, you, if you want to decompress the canal, that's all you need to do. When the nerve starts to curve medially or become transverse, then you don't need to go any further back. And we tend to split the nerve sheath. There is controversy again on whether we should or should not be splitting the nerve sheath. But in this institution, we tend to split the nerve sheath. Um, if you split the nerve sheath, uh, there is always a risk of causing a CSF leak. But nevertheless, uh, we also believe that, uh, or rather results indicate that the quantum of recovery is more if you split the nerve sheath. So we tend to slit the nerve sheath for patients with trauma. Once in a while you need to drill, as I said, this is an optic nerve decompression on the left side, and again you can see that this time you've needed to drill and then decompress the canal and then slit the nerve sheath. And uh, on this video you see that as you slit the nerve sheath, you'll get a little bit of CSF as you come anteriorly. And once in a while that happens, it happened to us now and then. The first time it happened to us was in 88, and that was the time when we were still doing, you see a little bit of CSF there. Uh, so um, if we get CSF, we basically put a small mucosal graft out there, but we do no more. Today visualization is very good. You can easily see this happening. And uh, as it is, CSF leaks are easily closed endoscopically, so it's not such a major worry if you get some CSF. Uh, but I've never really seen a major CSF gusher come out of this. So it's unusual to get major CSF gushers out there. If you do, you put in a mucosal graft. So this is how we generally do it. So PPL positive after and pupillary defect after head injury. 
patient comes to you, you do the routine evaluation, you give the steroids. As is Dr. Mahapatra said, a lot of patients improve, most do. The very few who don't come in for surgery and generally after surgery you can expect some improvement. Now if you go through our results, our results are uh, summarized in these two papers which come from our, uh, our group again. Uh, so one is about delayed optic nerve decompression. This is really to put to rest uh, what Dr. Mahapatra has been talking about and speaking of Dr. Fukado's results, wherein uh, the, the, the issue that if you, you should operate on these patients immediately and if you don't do it immediately then you lose the chance of improving those patients. We don't believe in that. You should give them medical treatment and even if that doesn't work adequately you can still do surgery and it tends to work. And the second paper is about splitting the nerve sheath and how it helps. So our data when we published it last in 2007 was till 2005. So we had 53 patients who had had surgery. This is my personal series, but yes, this department had done far more. So this was my personal series at that time. Um, most of these patients had injuries which were, uh, had decompressions which were done fairly late. So injury to surgery interval 16 to 374 days. This is about delayed optic nerve decompression. Um, and uh, before I tell you as to what, how effective it was, let me tell you that it is safe to do. So these are the complications we have, which we have had. Nothing very major. A couple of patients who had CSF leak like the one you saw. Uh, and these are our results. And the point to note out here basically is that patients who were PL negative, out here you see the patient, the pre-op vision, and out here you see the post-op vision. And uh, um, if you draw this line, then anybody who's on left of that line has basically had no improvement because the pre-op vision is no better than post-op. But the important thing is that patients who had PL negative stayed PL negative. So patients who are PL negative after medical treatment probably don't need surgery. Dr. Mahapatra said that. But patients who have some residual vision tend to improve. And in our results, 80% of our patients improve. Having said that, patients don't improve completely. And if you look at patients who had vision of better than 6 by 18, which is what we call as really useful vision, vision you could use to read, then only 25% of patients get there. So a lot of patients improve, 80% of your patients improve, but only 25% of patients improve enough. These are some complicated stats to look at the quantum of improvement so that we can run some tests. And this is the important test that we run and which again looks at the quantum of improvement. The mean quantum of improvement we get in our patients is about 40%. And what it's really showing is that whether you do the operation immediately or a little bit later, there's no dramatic difference in the quantum of improvement in each group. So the quantum improvement in each group has been around 40%. Not the number of patients improving, but the quantum of improvement. So it's gone beyond just that two out of four improved or three out of five improved, but also as to how much they improve. So even in how much they improve, there doesn't seem to be any dramatic difference if you operate late. And this is another analysis which looks at the impact of various factors. And there is fractures, which is a bad prognostic sign. The grade of injury, grade, these injuries are graded on depending on whether they have fractures and PL negative. Grade two is injury when patients whose vision never dropped to PL negative and who never had a fracture. This is a good prognostic group. And the last analysis shows the effect of an optic nerve sheath incision. So patients who have had optic nerve sheath incisions have tended to improve more than patients who haven't had an incision. So 45% recovery in patients who had optic nerve incision and 33% in those who didn't. So that's what we tend to do now. So if I conclude, delayed optic nerve decompression, delayed optic nerve decompression is effective. So the whole philosophy is delayed. The immediate treatment is medical treatment as Dr. Mahapatra said, and surgery is only undertaken delayed. And I just want to emphasize that even if surgeries indicate delayed, it can be an effective intervention. Don't do it in patients who have PL negative. You can do it in patients who have fractures provided they're not PL negative. It's a poor prognostic sign, but not an absolute sign. These are our results for patients who have partial visual loss. These are the only patients we operate now. PL negative, we don't operate. Persistent PL negative, we don't operate. So partial visual loss, 80% of patients will show some improvement. 25% of them will improve enough to get to 6 by 18. Grade 2 injury, this is patients who never drop down to PL negative and who don't have a fracture. 95% of patients will show some recovery and 40% of patients will come down to 6, 18 or above. So it's a worthwhile operation to do. And uh, certainly, as you said, it does seem to make sense to slit the optic nerve sheath, and I just told you why. The quantum of recovery has been better, and it stands to reason because we 
tend to say that these are patients who have concussion injury, vicospasm, edema, and much of the pressure which is on the nerve is inside the sheet. So you have to slit the sheet. Right, thank you. Uh, time for a question or two? Any questions for Dr. Thakur? Um, uh, so let me say this, that um, uh, I find that the VEPs were uh, very much more reliable previously than they are today. So I think there's an issue with VEP reliability. If the VEP is positive, it's a great sign. If the VEP is negative, I don't take it oh, too yeah, seriously. Yeah, VEP yeah. positive, uh, I take it. One of our postgraduate in between 1995 and 97 studied 100 PL negative and they were having several VEPs. Those who are repeatedly VEP positive, about 22 percent have some improvement. So VEP is positive VEP is more predictive and sometimes PL negative, okay? Depending on what time you are taking. Suppose a person is PL negative after one year. If you are talking PL negative after three days or five days or seven days, I am talking one year. One of my patients who was operated at 374 days, he was a CRP Jovan and PL negative. And we operated in 19, 2001, September. He improved after 374 days, PL negative. So in bioscience, there is nothing but mathematics. But because his BPs are positive. And after 374 days, one person from paramilitary came to us and we operated and improved. It's good luck, but in science, like bioscience, it's not physics or chemistry, two plus two is four. Two plus two previous would be six. I, I, I just want to be the devil's advocate, I would say, because uh, I'm asking actually this question, uh, it's a common resident query. In the last two decades of my in stay in the institute, the two people I know of is Dr. Alok Thakkar and Dr. Mahapatra regarding optic nerve injury. So I think this is the right platform to ask this question. Steroids, they have really been cautioned a big time in spinal cord injuries. It's almost out. Traumatic brain injury, out. In optic nerve injury, we always say yes, give st steroids to patients who are having PL positive or even those PL negatives. What I would say is that, why maybe they improve on their own. A spinal cord injury patients, incomplete spinal cord injury, you don't do anything, they do improve. And probably the same thing could be happening to the optic nerve injuries also. Right. Second thing is, the moment you see a chip, a chip of a bone in the, in the CT windows, the first thing is you decompress, take it out early. The same thing holds true for the spinal cord injuries also. You see some segment impinging on the glass, the first impetus is to take out the mechanical uh, uh, kind of uh, thing which is pressing on. However, in the management of the optic nerve injuries, our guidelines are completely different. So what we have learned over the last two decades is patients who have improved but have become static. Yes, you go ahead and there is some role. So my point is, are, th are they improving on their own or are we really offering them something by giving them steroids? Do steroids really, really make a difference or not? I'll let Dr. Mahapatra offer the first one. I'll, offer the I'll answer the second about. one. We yeah. When you talk about, please don't misunderstand. It's all wrongly quoted that steroid has no role in heading. When you talk about steroid and injury, you talk about in terms of reducing intracranial pressure. Do not understand. Steroid has seven different properties from membrane stabilization to liposomal enzyme to function the neuron. Even the neuronal function steroid has a role. So do not confuse on for heaven's sake, steroid has no role in head injury. What repeatedly assured steroid do not reduce intracranial pressure fasting, okay? So the question, but in a minor head injury, when the data of uh, crash trial analyzed, long-term epilepsy was less in the group of steroids. Read the every line of a paper. We just don't read paper in the proper perspective. So steroids do not reduce intracranial pressure, hence has no role in reducing intracranial pressure. Does the steroid membrane stabilize? Yes. Does the steroid improve the neuronal function? Yes. Does it stabilize the liposomal? Yes. So how much they contribute outcome, we don't know. Second thing, does steroid work in optic spinal cord injury? It doesn't help in improvement of clinical status. But does it reduce edema? We don't know. Second, when you come to international optic nerve study group, 250 patients, 
The conclusion is steroid helps. Is not correct? You read this paper in Annals of uh, Ophthalmology. Annals of Ophthalmology. You read that. The steroid doesn't work, doesn't say. Whether steroid not given, there is a statistical improvement that the steroid group has a better outcome. Thank you, Dr. Mahapatra. You want uh, me to answer the second question? Or you don't? Well, I think uh, we What do you think, uh, my chair? <laughs> <Poor> chair. <laughs> yes. So the issue was if there's an optic nerve fracture impinging on the nerve, should you be doing immediate surgery? Um, best available evidence uh, as exists today tells us that fracture is a, wrong, is a poor prognostic sign. We also tell you that if a patient is PL negative for two weeks after that, it's probably not worthwhile operating on a patient. Before that, we don't quite know. So patients can improve. Maybe some patients improve spontaneously. We tend to operate as soon as it is safe to do. So when it's safe to do, it depends on a lot of things. It depends on intracranial status. It depends on whether or not the patient has another carotid injury next to it. It depends on whether he has limb injury, thoracic injury, all of that. All we are saying is don't rush into surgery immediately. Be safe. It doesn't have to be done immediately. Steroids are also effective even if there's a fracture. Even if there's a fracture, steroids are still an effective procedure when it becomes safe to do operate. If that is five days, do it five days. If there's 10 days, do it 10 days. If there's three months, do it three months. So uh, yes, if there's a fracture uh, it, uh, and it's impinging on the nerve, it seems uh, sensible to release that pressure. But sometimes injury is so bad that it's PL negative and the nerve is lacerated. There's no point operating. You have to be aware of that situation. And sometimes it's too risky to operate and you have to be aware of that situation. So we still do steroids and we still do surgery as soon as it's safe to do. Uh, sir, regarding the role of steroids, uh, I have a small clarification. Uh, sh sh uh, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Thakur. Uh, now is my... And now I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Richard Trivedi to present her t presentation titled Head Trauma, Basics and Preclinical Directions. Very good morning to all of the participants of ANTC 2015. Uh, myself, Dr. Richard Trivedi, I'm working at Institute of Nuclear Medicine and Allied Sciences. The Today's, uh, the topic of today's talk is traumatic brain injury, basics and preclinical direction. As we all know that TBI is defined as damage to the brain resulting from an external mechanical force such as acceleration, deacceleration, impact, blast, or it may be penetration by a projectile. So because of the external mechanical force, brain get damaged and it deform. So uh, it leads to temporary or perma permanent impairment of cognitive, physical and psychosocial function, function. Clinically, broadly, TBI can be divided in based on the severity, mechanism, and pathological features. Based on severity, it can be uh, classified into mild, moderate, and severe, uh, severe category. The, uh, on the basis of mechanism, it can be uh, uh, classified broadly into the closed uh, head injury as well as penetrating head injury. And uh, based on the pathological features, it can be classified as diffuse or uh, focal, extraaxial, intraaxial, like this. 
TBI, it's, uh, this is not a single event as you all know that it's a very complex disease process. It has both the primary as well as the secondary injury. So as a result of the external force, the mechanical tissue deformation happens and at the same time it also causes the neuronal depolarization and it uh, causes the release of uh, in, well, like influx of calcium ion. Then uh, the secondary uh, initiation of the secondary injury started and uh, so many uh, neurotransmitter, especially the aspartate and glutamate releases and it gets attached with their receptors and uh, they causes the calcium influx which in turn uh, damage the mitochondria energy deficit happens and also help in production of the free radical uh, which uh, uh, oxidizes the lipid fat and the protein molecule and it also elicits the production of cytokines and chemo kinds which in turn damage the blood brain barrier causes edema increased intracranial pressure altered cerebral flow and other pathologies associated with head trauma and it this finally leads to the functional deficit in an individual animal model uh, the people are using animal model the first uh, uh, the need of the animal model is because uh, the pathophysiological heterogeneity which is seen which is observed in the clinical in, in the TBI patient maybe it arises maybe due to the different location of injury and uh, so many uh, other pre-existing conditions like drug abuse uh, some other pathology already present in the individual sex or uh, genetic uh, differences etc but in the animal model we can control all these conditions we, uh, by using the animal model uh, relatively homogeneous uh, injury can be made uh, uh, can be uh, made but the problem in the tbi is not a single animal model it it can mimic all the secondary injury happens in uh, the human tbi so for this so many animal models are uh, people are using uh, more more than uh, a dozen uh, animal model for uh, developing for the modeling of traumatic brain injury so uh, these are the animal model which people are using for to uh, develop the traumatic brain injury among them these four co control cortical injury weight drop model fluid percussion in injury model and blast injury model these are the widely used animal model and uh, in uh, this is the comparative sheet where we where i am trying uh, i try to show the strength and weakness of the animal model like the cci the, in the cort uh, control cortical impact model mainly it, it's uh, mainly produces the focal injury in the among the weight drop model the murmura it uh, by using this model mainly diffuse injury can be created and using the FPI model, that is a fluid percussion model, both uh, diffuse as well as a focal injury can be created. And uh, the blast model, which is um, basically uh, uh, like uh, it's a diffuse, it creates the diffuse axonal injury. And it is the model which is uh, of military, it is, though it's uh, important for both military as well as the civilian uh, uh, population, but it's, uh, it has importance more in the military scenario. These are the various pathological features which can simulate using this model by using the weight drop model, the concussion and the axonal, uh, diffuse axonal injury. These are the two pathological uh, conditions which can uh, simulate, we, which we can simulate using Fenny weight drop model. The contusion can be simulate. The fluid percussion model, it is the most widely used uh, animal model. Using this model, contusion can be very well uh, uh, recapitulate. And using the uh, control cortical uh, blast, both contusion and the hemorrhage, this can be simulated. So this is the fluid percussion model. In this model, uh, this is the fluid percussion model. In this model, the, this pendulum is used to create the uh, fluid pressure pulse. So it strikes the piston here and it, uh, this uh, reservoir is full of saline. So it creates a fluid pressure pulse and the animal is uh, placed here and splenectomy has been done at uh, the, this place at the lateral position in the brain so what happens is strike the dura meter and create the injury so fpi model can be divided into three based on the surgery based on the surgery if we do the surgery at the sagittal uh, suture then it is known as the midline model and if it is it is not at the midline it's somewhere lateral but less than 3.5 mm that is the parasagittal model and the lateral model if the distance is more than 3.5 mm lateral 
the only uh, problem with this model is we can control uh, the severity only by uh, by this pendulum by the strength of uh, pendulum hitting the piston second is the control cortical impact model in this uh, the both the pneumatic as well as electromagnetic impact devices are there so what they use they uh, this rigid uh, impactor is there so they hit it hit the animal brain so uh, what the because uh, in this case also connectomies can be done so uh, this is a very uh, comfortable and uh, easy model where we can control the depth and uh, other mechanical factor to uh, control the severity of disease third is the weight drop model weight drop tbi model so in this model uh, this uh, the skull is exposed to a free falling guided weight so in this uh, model both uh, the people have developed so many models so these are the two important model one is the fenny model where kinectomy has been done and in the second marmoraus model where uh, the skull is exposed but the skull is intact it's not uh, uh, it's not cut so in the marmorai weight drop model uh, the, this helmet it's uh, steel uh, steel plate is used where the weight hit so it it act like a helmet and it produces the diffuse injury in uh, uh, not the focal injury so in the fenny in the fenny model uh, this is uh, no helmet kind of thing is there so it's uh, it more produce more focal injury as compared to the diffuse injury this uh, now the blast tbi blast tbi uh, the expert of blast tbi is with us dr chandra and dr gupta so maybe in uh, the coming session they will discuss more about the blast tbi blast tbi we can be simulated by two means it can be simulated by using the blast uh, shock wave a uh, shock tube as well as we can also simulate by deto uh, by detonating and uh, detonation in the open field so in the this is the uh, shock tube uh, it is it is uh, attached with the compressor so uh, we can uh, over pressurize the dr driver section and driver and driver section they are uh, they are separated by a mylar sheet so when it 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 uh, reaches up to some threshold so it ruptures and it create the shock wave inside the tube and uh, uh, animal can be placed uh, uh, at the other end of the shock tube where it experience the that shock so it simulate the primary injury of the blast wave tube that is uh, because of the high pressure uh, high pressure waves so <coughs> now the limitation of current animal model first thing is uh, we we are trying to develop so many animal model and we are working uh, a lot on them but the main problem with them is difference in brain structure and function ultimately we we want to translate that research into human but the problem is uh, because of the uh, like uh, though the large animal are more close to human but we cannot do we, we are not com very much comfortable with them we use rodent for the uh, uh, for small animal and rodent for the tbi research because of the lower cost and uh, comfortably we can handle them so but the brain structure is very different between uh, the rodents and the human brain because of uh, the gyral ratio is uh, different the gray matter uh, ratio is different so this is one of the problem then is the sex difference as we know that female uh, hormones they interfere with the disease process so in this direction also research is very much required then the monitoring of physiological devices it's very much important in the tbi uh, pre clinical research that researcher should uh, monitor the physiological variable before and after uh, injury then the injury severity me measurement it's very uh, it's very standard in case of human for the clinical uh, cases it's uh, gcs and other scores are very well present where, where worldwide people are using uh, for the uh, um, uh, severity of the tbi but in the animal model no such kind of system is there the different labs are different uh, using their uh, their uh, own standardized uh, measurement for them so for the uh, global uh, research we need a uh, standard injury severity me uh, measurement worldwide now these are the f uh, few slides where which we did uh, which uh, where we uh, we did some mild uh, injury experiment at enmas 
So this was the uh, protocol where we uh, weight drop model, Marmarau weight drop model was used for the simulation of blast, uh, for uh, the simulation of uh, uh, weight drop injury in uh, the rodent. So imaging was done at zero uh, day, four day, four hours, day one, day three and day five. Then uh, the, uh, this figure is showing the placement of ROI where we calculated the different parameters, imaging parameters at the uh, place of cortex, hippocampus and corpus callosum. Then uh, we did the, the uh, we did the diffusion tensor imaging on these animal and we saw, we tried to see the temporal changes in the mean diffusivity and uh, friction isotropy values in these animals. So in this study, we observed that uh, the mean diffusivity was decreased at day three and day five, which can be very well visualized on the statistical graph where we can see on the repeated measure ANOVA, we observed a significant de uh, decrease in the mean diffusivity value at day, th day three and day five in uh, these animals. And we ob also observed the radial decrease in radial diffusivity as day one, day three and day five in these animals. Then uh, this is the uh, uh, image where, where we trying to show the uh, fraction isotropy values also, but no change in FA was observed in any of the region. We also did the, infra we also tried to see the inflammatory response in these animals and we observed the increased GFAP cells per, uh, per field of view in these animals that was elicited at the day three and day five, which was very well correlated with the, uh, with our, uh, uh, with our imaging data. And we also try to do the t uh, TNF alpha, uh, calculate the TNF alpha levels as well as IL-10 levels in these animals. And we observed that the uh, upregulated TNF alpha expression as well as the IL-10 uh, expression in these animals. Then what we did in uh, the next set of study, we tried to see the um, uh, metabolic profile of the animal with mild traumatic brain injury. So we did this study in the three phase. In the first phase, the PMRS, uh, the uh, P uh, proton uh, um, magnetic resonance spectroscopy was done in the animal. So it was done at uh, uh, like uh, before injury at four hours, day one, day three and day five. Then at the second phase, uh, uh, we also give the anesthesia at the time of imaging as well as at the time of uh, when we give the injury. So in the phase two, to negate the effect of anesthesia, we took two more groups. That was the injury only and the anesthesia only. In the injury only group, no, uh, like no imaging was done. Only injury was uh, given to the animal and uh, uh, and in the anesthesia only group only anesthesia was given through that group no injury was there so we had three group one was injury with anesthesia second was only anesthesia and third was the only injury group and uh, in the fourth phase of study we what we did we uh, took all the four group control injury with anesthesia only anesthesia and only injury group and we uh, uh, neurobehavioral analysis was done in all these groups just to see whether the changes was observed in the behavior analysis was due to the injury or anesthesia or it was a mixed effect. So uh, on the PMRS study, uh, taurine was decreased at day five. Taurine was on repeated measure ANOVA, taurine was decre decreased at day five. When we, uh, when we compared all the group and uh, try to see the uh, taurine, taurine was again decreased in this group. And in the injury only group also, there was decrease in taurine as compared to the control group. So we can say that the decrease in taurine, it is due to the injury, not because of the anesthesia. So we also, as I said, we also did the neurobehavioral analysis in these mild the TBI rodent model. So in this uh, model, we observed the anxiety correlate it, it showed the significant difference in the group as compared to the other. But the interesting thing was both the anesthesia and injury, uh, the anxiety was high in both the uh, anesthesia only group as well as the injury group. So we can say that uh, NSC, as we all know that anesthesia also uh, mo modulate the anxiety. So both these uh, things are important. So we conclude in this study that anesthesia also modulate anxiety and injury also modulate anxiety. But the taurine was uh, low because of the injury. Thank you, sir. Okay.
Uh, there's uh, some time for a question if you have so someone has a question for Dr. Trivedi. Uh, uh, okay, nothing. This, no questions, uh, then uh, we're going to close this session. Uh, thank you very much. We'll move on to our next session, which will be on neurotrauma update. May I invite the chairpersons for the next session? Professor Manmohan Singh, Professor of Neurosurgery at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And Professor Parmod Bittal, Professor of um, Neuroanesthesia and Head of the Department Neuroanesthesia at, at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Here at this point, yeah, that is it. Uh, Good morning, everybody. So, I, along with my co chair, President Dr. Mamo Singh, welcome you all to our session. Uh, I, along with my co chair, President Dr. Mamo Singh, welcomes you to all this, uh, all the all for this session. It, this session, have we got two lectures, both the lectures will be delivered by Dr. Namas Chandra from US. going to speak on the biomechanics of blast and blunt neurotrauma. Good morning, everybody. I think uh, uh, so. As as mentioned, I'm going to talk about the two aspects of it. The first aspect is the biomechanics aspect, uh, really in terms of the neurotrauma itself, as in general, that will include both blunt and blast TBA and others, and what should be observed. The second will focus mainly on the the the, <coughs> the blast injury. So if you look at the idea of the injury, we have been talking about from a number of different aspects and perspectives. One of the perspectives is uh, from the from clinician side, how do you really diagnose a patient, treat a patient, what are the various ideas that you need once you observe it. From a different perspective, I will try to bring in the idea, the injuries are caused by external mechanical forces. When those forces change, then the type of injury changes. So injury alone does not really give you an indication of what the, the severity is, is how to treat them. So I, at least having some knowledge of how the injury is created is going to have a better concept of where it is going in terms of the treatment and others. Because as you know, in these particular cases, what you observe is only a partial of what is going on in the brain itself. For example, if there is a hemorrhage, you observe an hemorrhage. But as you know, there are a lot of MRI CT that clearly tells you that you can see many other things. And a lot of long-term effects and the short-term effects are directly coming from them. So going back to the simple idea that we, if we classify TBI actually mainly as three independent types. One is actually called a blunt injury. The 
in the blunt injury, for example, you can have a different types of injuries here. This is the kind of sports injury. This is very typical of an Indian climate. For example, I think we talked about the helmet. It is not only one person is not in wearing the helmet. There is nobody in this family is wearing the helmet, as you can see. And it's not unusual, as you, many of you know, the road accident and also in terms of fall. In these, all these kind of injuries generally is done under the blunt impact. In the blunt impact, typically what it is, is there are two bodies coming into contact by external forces and then the causes injury, either the focal or non-focal, and the type is what, what causes this. And I'll talk a little bit about this. And the second is called the ballistics injury. The ballistic injury, essentially an external agent, in this particular case, is a bullet or a shrapnel or any penetrants penetrates inside the injury and causes it. As you know, in this particular case, it's not only the bullet can come out or stay inside, depending upon the kinetic energy, but also creates a wave of energies. And all those tissues and damages take place in this particular case. For example, if you look at the CT alone, you see this is the injury here. But if you do not understand that basically all the path that has taken is also injured, you are going to only treat the symptom, but not the whole thing. That's something we need to be aware of. And as uh, uh, medical clinicians, it will be good to know the type of injury that has caused so that we know what are the manifestations that you observe and what are the things that you don't observe. Because what you don't observe is what is going to really have a long-term effect, for example. Right. So this is the one. And of course, I think we come back to this primary injury, the, in this case of blast injury. The blast injury is caused by a very simple idea that there is an explosion, that explosion explodes, produces high energy, that high energy produces shock waves. Those shock waves travel in the air and really goes very fast in terms of yes, rise time of microseconds and the overall time of milliseconds and those causes injury. Then that will also turn in terms of translational, rotational and other types what I call actually as the biomechanical mechanisms. In terms of injury itself, there are two types of mechanisms we can think of. One is a biomechanical mechanisms. What is that? For example, a rotational injuries that it rotates, that can be measured. Or for example, a cavitation occurs in the body. Or there's a penetration occurs in the body. There's a coup counter coup injury that occurs. All these are biomechanical factors. These are the external insult that causes. The second one is one that actually in terms of biological factors. For example, oxidative stresses, the nitrogenative stresses, blood-brain barriers, ischemias, and others are all factors that is initiated by those particular biomechanical factors. To distinguish the biomechanical factors, you can see there are many insulations here. So this is a generic idea, what we call as an insult. Insult is a mechanical force that causes or initiates the injury part. That's the insult. This insult itself can be in terms of blast, or in terms of penetration, or in terms of the blood. So that insult really causes the injury. So injury can be now it is observed. These are some of the observations like EDH, BAI, SCH, all of the observations through CT, MRI, and others. This ob observes one. And not only that, at the, at the level of cellular and molecular level, we find a number of things, for example, SNAP, say, or in terms of astrocytes or other factors that affect the scale. So there's a scale issue here in terms of what is observed macroscopically, what is observed microscopically. There's a time issue involved. The time issue are all in terms of cascade. For example, what is observed in millisecond to second in terms of blood-brain barrier, hemorrhage, and others may be different in terms of what is observed in terms of days and weeks. So this progression is a progression that is initiated by the insult, but essentially progresses based on how the insult is caused. So that needs to be cognizant of what we are doing. Then, of course, I said medical outcomes. This actually is what I think we observe. There's a cognitive deficiency. There's an emotional behavioral deficiency in terms of anxiety and others. There's also physical deficiency in terms of balance and others. So basically, this is the deficiency that as doctors, you see. The patient comes along, and then after one day, three days, five days, you still see a deficiency. But this deficiency can be caused due to multiple factors. It can be caused due to some axonal injuries, or it can be caused due to deficient axonal injuries, for example, in terms of brain stems, 
there are things that takes place because of the way the insult has taken place, because the way the injury has occurred, that the manifestations and the effect is taking place. We just cannot be curing the effect. We have got to understand the primary cause so that the effect can be done. And that, I feel, is the primary message. So there is actually a continuum in terms of essentially the insult, the type of insult that causes the injury, that causes the medical outcome. We just cannot be treating this, or I cannot be just working on the insult alone. So I think that is a fundamental message I want to understand. I want you to understand. Really, I think there are when we're trying to treat something, we also need to look at what are the effects of them. For example, in this specific case, of course, I'll talk more about this blast. But in general, I think it is true that, for example, neurotrauma can be caused, as I just said, blast, blunt. The injury can be primary, the primary in the sense that causes. For example, let's take the blunt. If we are taking a blunt, the blunt impact is caused by motor vehicle accident, fall, or sports. These are the three type of one. Motor vehicle accidents really depends on the, what the velocity of the speed. For example, is he, is he going in a car or is he going in a motorbike? If they're going in a car or motorbike, the velocity of that or the speed in which it is happening is going to make a difference. And that, I think, will manifest itself differently. And also, where the position is, are in the driver's seat, back seat, or where they are wearing the seat belt. And last but not the least, the protection. We talked about the protection in terms of head protection, helmet, what they are wearing and what they are not wearing. For example, you have a motorbike with and without protection, it is going to make a difference. And the same way, for example, fall. The fundamental parameter is where it is feeling fall. Is he falling just directly, sitting in the chair and falling down, or is he falling from a different height? All these things fundamentally will change the energy transfer from external agents to the brain, and hence the type of injury that is being manifested. And that, I think, again, is, is, is what I'm trying to make. And again, the protection. In the space of sports, the type of sports. Are you looking at football, soccer, or, uh, or in terms of skiing accidents? Each of them will have a different type of mechanical loading and the way in which it is acting. Dr. Mahapatra has talked about bilateral, counterlateral. All those things really tell us about that's the force. The force, how, what is it really damaging? Is it damaging the left nerve or the right nerve? Once you know what the damage occurs, then we know how to treat them. It is not just a question of, okay, whether it is occurring one or two, but because of the damage has occurred. The damage can be and should be quantified before the treatment occurs. The same thing in terms of ballistics. We look at the gunshots, shrapnel, sniper edges. Again, the question really is speed and things. In the case of blast, for example, which I'm going to talk a little bit more, it's a question of strength. Yeah, 1 pound C4 or 10 pound C4 will be very different in terms of its effect. How far are you from this? Are you 1 meter away, 5 meters away, 10 meters away? That also will dictate the type of energy that is going to be imparted to the brain or the head and neck, and it is going to cause. And that, that's the basic idea here. So, of course, this is all important. This is all, the, all I call as a biomechanical factor. The biological factor is very important. For example, the age of the patient, the gender. And the health status, for example, the young versus old, in terms of what the status are and the treatment type. Like we talked about all this morning about the treatment type in terms of when are you treating, when are you not treating. All this will really also pay a path in terms. So overall, I think when you want to treat, we are all to actually not only consider the biological factors or what is observed, but also the root cause between what is happening. Because that will actually make a difference. Okay. So I think in... in Uh, so I think one of, one of the challenges in blast TBI is essentially in terms of what I, I'll talk more about this later on. So if you look at this mechanism, Dr. Gupta uh, elucidated this idea, just in looking at the blast TBI. If you look at the biomechanical factor, the biomechanical factors can be due to direct shock transmission. So a shock can be there. Shock is a high pressure wave that passes by. So those pressure wave can directly transmit. Or it can have an indirect way in which the skull can flex. For example, like if it goes along, the, 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 the skull itself can really basically like, like, like a, a, a tube can be just pr pressurized and depressurized that can cause yes, also what happens inside. It can also have a cavitation, thoracic surge. These are the various mechanisms. Why is this important? Because this will cause different type of injuries to the tissues. Those injuries then will really have different outcomes. The outcome alone may not be able to be enough, but you have to really look at that, right? So, for example, in this particular case of shock, one of the things we have been trying to do is really look at the shock tubes. We want to model the shock tube. 
or for example, like in the earlier talk, uh, Richa elucidated the various types of animal models. All of these models in some sense are good because I think you can now vary them very uh, rationally and then try to understand the effects. And the bad is because I think they don't represent the real situation in the field. Rats are human, though some rats are humans and some humans are rats, but mostly rats and humans are different. So in this particular case, what happens is when you try to look at this, both in terms of the brain structure, the brain size, the, uh, and the understanding that you are getting from the rat, when you want to translate it to human, there are a number of factors that needs to be understood in terms of how it goes over there, right? So we need other models. So in this particular case, for example, we have pressure time. What happens is when the shock wave goes along, it has got high pressure, shorter duration. As you go further and further down, you have a larger pressure and a larger duration. And that's what make, makes a difference. So somebody standing here, five feet, or somebody five meters, or eight meters, or 18 meters, will experience a completely different type of loading and hence a type of injury. So I'm just going to actually demonstrate one case about this, and I think we'll go here. This particular one, as you see here, is actually an explosion about 5 pound C4. C4 is a type of explosion. And here, what you have here is a dummy head. The dummy head anthropometrically represents the human head, but in this particular case, we have got foot sensors for seven sensors everywhere. Those sensors represent what the head sees when you're in a blast. Okay. So that day, you know how you'll be feeling it. So what you're going to see in this case is, there's no sound. Okay, well, I think there's a big sound. Okay, imagine you have, you saw a sound. This is what exactly what you will see when you have an explosion of five pounds, right? The same one. Okay, this is, this is the, the helmet. Now you can see here, the same in very slow motion. Are you able to see that wave that went along? Let me try again, I think. In this particular case here, you had a wave that went there and then it had interacted with the head, okay? So, when you are subject to the blast, depending upon where you are, depending upon the strength, that shock wave is passing by. And you can see in the earlier video that you don't even see anything because it go happens in in a millisecond region. Or this is a high speed camera that we capture it. So one of the first things we need to do is to make sure, so we put a sensor here. The sensor, this sensor is a high pressure sensor which is capable of monitoring the rise in pressure in microsecond. Microsecond, 10 power minus six of a second. That actually is a microsecond. The whole thing takes place in about seven to eight milliseconds. Millisecond again, one thousandth of a second. So this is the exactly what, if you are in a field, if you are under an explosion and having an head injury, is what you are going to see. And this is exactly what you are seeing. So what we did was basically I think we developed a method, the shock tube, which I will talk about a little bit later on. Essentially this shock tube in the lab <coughs> will be able to generate what happens in the field into the laboratory. Okay? This is what happened. And then we go back to a sensor number two. You can see it's a little bit different because basically as a shock wave goes by, what you're seeing the front is slightly different from the physics here is different. Rod is different here and the side is different. So you go back again, you can see, and you can see again, it's a laboratory and sensor. So you can see on the side. So what this demonstrated is, now I have a system, this being the field, this being the laboratory, that one now we can regenerate the actual conditions, right? So this is exactly what is the basis for the design of the shock tube. So we have a shock tube. That particular shock tube is able to replicate it. So one of the fundamental things in trying to understand how the injuries are caused is to make sure, I think, you repeat the injury and control them properly so that we can go back. You control whatever is controllable. For example, a lot of biological factors we cannot control. However, you can control some of the factors. You control whatever can be controlled. So in this case, for example, we go back and say, well, okay, so you have now a shark tube that for a variety of reasons, I think you can go back and look at the shark, right? And, and basically, I think this is what you can do the animal model. One of the basic ideas is 
If you have a larger shock tube, which I'm going to describe in a second, then we have somewhere in the middle, for example, here, this again, as I told you, the shock wave goes in a microsecond and a millisecond. It really doesn't even have time to move. So you have to really test it in the right locations. Okay? When you try to test it somewhere here, you don't get the right answer. Okay? So we had uh, we have published this. The basic idea is this. So this is our shock tube. This shock tube was designed with a lot of effort, and it took a, almost a year for us to do the design. When the design was done, at the center of this particular place, we can exactly recreate what I just showed, talked to you about in the laboratory. Okay? So in other words, we can recreate what is seen and measured in the laboratory, sorry, in the, in the field. Okay? So once you do that, there are a number of parameters. I'm not, it's all engineering ideas. I don't want to tell you that. But basically, the idea is we can change the parameters. And for example, we can change the type of gas, the locations, and the effort, the gas, other temperatures. All of these things can be changed. Okay? And this is where the gas are placed. This is where the animals are placed. And this is the whole, whole uh, setup. Okay? So the fundamentally, I think, all, all I want to do is this. So this, if you look at it, the red line, red line is experimental data, actual experimental data. But you can see here, the rise time is microsecond. It can reach like 70 kPa, 120 kPa, 300 kPa. And that, uh, the green line is a theory, and the red line is experiment. So what does it really mean is this. In order to really develop a good model, we need to understand the origin of the mechanical loading. For example, somebody wants to fall. You need to know where the falling occurs. And what is it being, where is it falling on? Whether it's falling head on or side on or how it is falling. Once you understand this, you need to really recreate that particular situation and then try to manipulate it. Okay, that's the basic idea here. Okay? And so in this particular case, we have done a lot of work on this uh, uh, rat model. Okay? I'm just going to just give you one example and then I think move on to the part two of the talk. One of the first things that uh, DOD, uh, Army, especially Dr. Gupta, asked us to say is, okay, we have this helmet. And Dr. Mahapatra and I are always interested in the idea of the helmet. We have the helmet. This helmet is basically being designed by, for various purposes. One helmet is not the same as other helmet. You design a helmet for a bicycle, it is different from the designing a helmet for a yeah, motorbike. Designing a helmet for a motorbike is different for the designing the helmet in the field. In the fields, you not only try to just fall down, you allow the bullet to stop. Okay? You not only want the bullet to stop, when you fall down from an airplane, you still don't want to get injured. Not only when you get an injury, when you want to go ha have an injury, you can't really go back and run away. So you go back and make, you should be taught for multiple injuries. But on the other hand, if you go to a bicycle or helmet, you don't want multiple injuries. You assume the guy when he falls down and the, if you want to break the helmet. So typically when you design a helmet for motorbike or for, for, uh, for, for the bicycles, you make sure the helmet is designed such that it breaks. It goes into pieces. And that's good. It's not bad. Because either that breaks or your head breaks. Okay? So the design is such that when you break it, it goes into pieces absorbing all the energies. So a helmet design really depends on what is the purpose, which is different for a different thing. So one of the first things we want to understand is, this is a helmet that is being by US Army. The question is, it was designed for taking bullets. It was designed for falling. The question we want to ask is, is this particular helmet good enough to really go for the blast? Because the blast is a new insert. So what we did is, we basically I think went back and took this idea. This is actually a dummy head. In the dummy head, we put all the sensors. I demonstrated already that sensors or realistic because through experimental validation in the field, and then try to just do the shock tube. This is exactly what the shock tube does. Okay. So what this is, what you saw was basically a six millisecond time frame by taking about hundred thousand frames per second camera, right? So six millisecond. So based on that, you could clearly see that there is a variation. As you can understand, basically what happens is if you have a helmet you still expose this area. This area is enough for it to penetrate. Unfortunately, this is good enough for it to go and directly behind this our prefrontal cortex. Okay, so I have an helmet. The helmet is doing a great job, but I'm not protecting it unless I really protect it. Okay, 
So next curve is an interesting curve which I think was very much useful. With the, this, is, this particular data shows you, if you have not had any helmet, what type of protection it gives. This is a black dot. This green dot tells you if you have a good helmet, what happens? If you have a helmet which is just open, like what we call a suspension helmet, you find the suspension helmet is worse than not wearing a helmet by direct experiments and direct measurements. Okay. Basically what happens in a helmet like this is it comes, air gets trapped, and it traps on the top, it basically allows more pressure to come inside, and it is worse than that. This was a very important study. Okay. So the, with that idea, what we wanted to conclude in the particular one is, in order to really look at the ideas of the brain injury, both in terms of blunt ballistics as well as in terms of blast, we really look at a holistic approach. The holistic approach should start from the medical outcome as being presented to you when the patient comes along. But before that uh, starts the other idea that going one step before, it is a type of injury both macroscopically and microscopically in terms of diffusion axonal injury or any type of injury CT and MRI shows you. At the macroscopic level, there are things that are happening at the cellular level, sometimes you're able to catch it, sometimes you're not. But both in terms of space and in terms of time, it really takes some of the chemical cascades to really take some time. And the second part of it I'm going to show in the blast, for example, how oxidative stresses takes time for it to develop. How blood brain barrier takes time for it to develop. How the neuronal injuries does not take place in the day one, but takes time. For example, Richard showed after three days something happened, after four days nothing happened. It doesn't happen automatically. It is because of the chemical cascades. So if you understand those mechanisms, then we know how to treat them and when to treat them. And so in order to really go, so we have to start and replicate the injury properly, whether we are falling down, or whether we are motor vehicle accident or blast, and then use that to understand the injury after insult, injury, and the medical outcome. This three holistically is needed for us to solve the brain injury, and just not one piece of it, either the biomechanics or biochemistry or the medicine. It has to be start joined together. And that was my message in the part one. <coughs> Uh, if, if there are any questions, we can go up or I can go back to the part two and finish it. Yeah. Sir, I have one question. Yeah. You say when the air enters and gets trapped, air absorbs more power and it damages. If you have a pockets of air, different places, does it change or diffuse the pressure? Because when I understand air is entered to a helmet and it becomes a trap, right. and the pressure is transferred to medium, right. solid versus gas. Right. And if this gas is here, here, and here, is the mechanism different? Right. So basically, I think <coughs> so. The, the, when the, the shock wave takes place, the shock wave propagates directly through the skin, through the skull, it spreads. Okay. It, it really, interestingly, it is only a five second, five millisecond duration, it's not a half to 20 milliseconds. When the shock accumulates on the top, it immediately penetrates from outside, through the inside, and you can, for example, on the, on the back side of it, in the visual cortex, you are finding higher pressure. All I am saying, what we did was, a two year experimental guy. This is a mechanical model. I don't know. So, what we did was we took a cadaveric model. We took an actual cadaver. I tried to put ballistic cell gel inside, put a various pressure gauges, pressure gauge outside, inside, and various locations inside the brain. Put the helmet on. Now, showed in those particular cases, there is actually a pressure rise when the helmet of suspension helmet of worn compared to the other helmet. So, it actually penetrates. It does penetrate. It is like this. When we in the city, we are actually a sound wave. The room next door, people still hear it because sound can pass through. But the shock, it has a much higher intensity. It can pass through skin. It can pass through skull. It can go through the brain. Okay? And it is not like it is, it is stop, stop. So there is a penetration that comes along that's called the direct transmission. Okay? So the shock does pass through, except it is a shorter duration. However, the intensity is very high. Intensity is very high, but the duration is small. Okay. All right. So the part two of it, the, any of the, I, I, we can come back to this. The part two of it really looking at, okay, having understood a good model. So what do we do with the model? The model by itself is really no good. So you want to look at some experimental method and biomedical aspect. That's what I think we're going to talk about a little bit. Uh, sir, Namas, I think uh, you need to uh, be a little faster because okay. we are running quite a short of time. Okay, yeah. all right. I'm very fast. Okay. <laughs> okay, so here. So in this particular case, it is a lot of animal models. In the animal model, what we did was basically, 
there used to be some timer, timer is missing, okay, all right. So, so in the animal model, we have this, uh, different animals. One of, one of the interesting things about, it, about the animal model itself is, we understand the animal model, there are lots of pros and cons. Pros is because you can repeat them, you can do all those things. Cons is essentially, I think, that there are complex scaling issues, they don't really represent it, we need to be cognizant of that, and we do anesthesia while you're doing the testing, they are all not that good, right? However, the must is we need to at least accurately replicate the learnings and at least measure what can be measured and those things, right? So, so in this particular case, this gives you the ideas. I'm going to go you quickly again because of lack of time. So what this tells you is in terms of the pressure, the pressure indicates the type of explosions that you're very close to it. Very close to it, high explosion, very far, less explosion. You find here there is a dose response curve based on about four finer animals saying there is a range in which the mild TBA occurs, moderate TBA, severe TBA, lethal TBA. This can be questionable, okay? And, but at least it's a first order approximation based on the dose response curve of more than 400 experiments, which is completely varied, okay? And so, uh, I don't know, I'm going to go ahead and skip this, okay? So we can actually develop computational models. The, uh, one of the important ideas about our number of experiments we can do, still we need to translate this da animal data to the human model. So you need to understand exactly what happens to the animal so that you can do this particular model. This is what we are trying to do. And this model really shows you where the interaction takes place. And what I'm going to show a little bit in the next few minutes is basically look at the mild TBI, which is this range, which is what we are interested in, and seeing what is the fundamental mechanism. Is it oxidative stress? Is it blood brain barrier? Is it mitochondria? Is it basically, I think, any other thing, for example, the apoptosis, necrosis? What is the that, that cause? So that's the basic idea here. I think so, in this particular case, these are the ideas that we looked at. So let's look at the acute stage of insult, both oxidative and nitrogen distresses. Looking at this in terms of blood brain barrier, when the leakage from blood to brain or blind to bad, okay? So these are various things. So in this particular case, what we did is what we did some enzymes, NOX1, INOX1. These are all for, uh, in, uh, for example, oxidative, for nitrosative. These are all for blood brain barrier leakages. This is blood to brain and brain to blood. So we have observed them, okay? So basic ideas, of course, I think we do animal model as an increasing amount of pressure. This is very similar to the idea of somebody falling at a different heights, if you're looking at it, or somebody going at a more and more faster, like 30 miles per hour, 40 miles per 50 miles per hour speed. So these are increasing things. The, unfortunately, some of them are not linear, okay? So we have it here. So if you look at the overall thing, you do find, based on this effect, even at 123 kPa, we find significant changes in the both oxidative and nitrogen distresses, both in terms of even low leg, both in terms of uh, western blotting, and the markers clearly show this, right? Okay, and one of the things you want to see is you get a control 60 clearly at some particular level. 100 to 130 kPa. 100 to 130 kPa is somewhere like ideas of 3 or 4 pound C4 at about 10 meters distance. Okay, that's the distance here. And you do find some changes taking place here. And I think again, uh, blood brain barrier markers, we clearly see the tight junction proteins are changed. What that really means is oxidative distresses are able to go back and uh, erode the tight junctions on the uh, perivascular side and then.